Did you ever wonder where the Israelites get all of those fine and expensive and precious items that they offer up to build the Mishkan in the desert? They have carved petals of pure gold and they have strips of cloth made from blue. They have purple and crimson yarn. They have blue wool and clasps of gold and copper. They have silver sockets. They have dolphin skins? <laughs> These are the raw materials of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the portable sanctuary <clears throat> that the Israelites are commanded to build in the desert. And they're described rather matter-of-factly, like these former slaves would just have them as pocket change or something. Well, 430 years of slavery is a very long time with a tremendous amount of loss and lost capital and the loss of one's roots. The Torah texts get really specific because the answer to the question of where did they get all this loot from is that indeed, to a certain extent, it was loot. On the way out of Egypt, the Torah emphasizes that the, that the Israelites get these things from the Egyptians. The Torah specifically describes that God will make this favorable in the eyes of the Egyptians that the Israelites are to, and there's a debate about the meaning of the word, they're either <clears throat> to uh, ask for or to borrow pure gold, silver, and lots and lots and lots of precious materials. Huh, is right. But this, God doesn't just describe this to the Israelites as they're leaving Egypt. God tells this to Moses. God says to Moses at the burning bush that the Israelites will indeed go out, but they will not go out empty-handed. And it even suggests, it says, that the Israelites emptied out the Egyptians. But God doesn't say this just to Moses. God says this to Abram, not Abraham. Abram, where he hasn't even yet had a chance to have his name changed. He's just Abram. And he is told that this people that's going to be this great and wonderful people that's going to number the stars of the sky. It will be an alien people in an alien land, and it will be persecuted and oppressed, but it will go out, and when it goes out, it will not go out empty-handed. Now, if you think this is just limited to the Torah, it's not. A thousand years after the Exodus is said to have happened, the rabbis who are writing the Talmud <coughs> Imagine a scene, a moment, under Alexander the Great, in which the Egyptians of that time bring a lawsuit against Israel. And they quote the Torah. They're reading the Torah, and they see that we Jews read this story over and over, every year. Almost like they're offended, like we're bragging about it. Ha ha! We had all this stuff from the Egyptians. And so the Egyptians, in front of Alexander the Great, say, Give it back! So a Jew, in this rabbinic imagination, walks up and says, Let me take a crack at it. So he says to the Egyptians, where are you getting this from? And the Egyptians say, your Torah. And he says, okay, but let me also quote something else from our Torah. And the Israelites' time in Egypt was 430 years. Give us payment for the labor 
of 600,000 whom you enslaved for 430 years. Alexander the Great looks to the Egyptians and says, yeah! <laughs> and the Egyptians say, we need to study this. <laughs> but the next thing they know, according to this story, the Egyptians leave thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of seeded lands and vineyards. They leave them for Israel. The Midrash piles on. It says that we Jews, that we left each with 90 Libyan donkeys. Abandoned fields and donkeys? 40 acres and a mule? In the Jewish imagination, the Egyptians recognized that what they give Israel wasn't nearly enough for all that had been stolen from them. At least 10 generations of stolen identity, roots, knowledge of self, the dignity of individuals, couples and families, people treated like chattel. And a thousand years later, we Jews still believe that there's more restitution to be made. There's almost nothing you could do that would be enough. Gloria Hollander Lyon of San Francisco was just a teenager in 1994 when she and her family were forced from their home in Czechoslovakia, first into a ghetto and then to Auschwitz-Birkenau. After the war, Lyon made her way to San Francisco, suffering from multiple health problems. In September 50, 1952, West Germany and Israel signed a reparations agreement to resettle uprooted and destitute Jewish refugees. Lyon applied in the mid-70s, and for the next 35 years, she received checks from the German government. It helped me buy what I need, we needed, she said. She initially used the funds to pay for medical expenses and get herself settled. I think reparations softened the blow. To date, Germany has paid 70 billion, with a B, billion dollars to Jews around the world. They call it their Wiedergutmachung, which in German means literally making good again. West Germany paid the state of Israel seven billion dollars in annual installments that jump-started the new economy. By 1956, German war reparations represented 87.5% of Israel's state revenue. So given this historical record, can we limit this act of reparation to just us? Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel who many of you have heard of or know of, the famous picture of him walking with Dr. Martin Luther King, Ralph Abernathy, John Lewis, in the march from Selma to Montgomery. Here you have these African-American men and then this relatively pale-faced white Jewish man who kind of looks like Einstein walking with them. And his, when his more orthodox colleagues said to Heschel, when did you pray? You were walking all day. When did you pray? And he said, my feet were praying. In 1963, Heschel wrote this to President John F. Kennedy. I look forward to the privilege of being present at meeting tomorrow at 4 p.m. Likelihood exists 
that Negro problem will be like the weather. Everybody talks about it, but nobody does anything about it. Please demand of religious leaders personal involvement, involvement and not just solemn declaration. We forfeit the right to worship God as long as we continue to humiliate Negroes. Churches and synagogues have failed. They must repent. Ask of religious leaders to call for national repentance and personal sacrifice. Let religious leaders donate one month's salary toward a fund for Negro housing and education. I propose that you, Mr. President, declare a state of moral emergency, a Marshall Plan to aid Negroes is becoming a necessity. The hour calls for high moral grandeur and spiritual audacity. This is the call of the modern day prophet. This is the call, like we just heard from Isaiah, haranguing his people at his time whose fast was not being hearkened to by God because they were fasting, but then they were beating up on their laborers and they were attending to business and they weren't keeping their place, their head in this right place of recognizing that the fast on Yom Kippur that we are called to, as Isaiah says, is a fast of un of breaking the chains of oppression. Judaism revolves around this concept. The most important piece of the Jewish story is the exodus from Egypt. It's what everything in our tradition centers around. We remember it each day and each week. We remember it on Passover. We remember it on Shavuot. We remember it all year long. We are obsessed with freedom. And by the way, in case we missed that these stories should elicit empathy for us, within us, for others who experience the same plight, the Torah doesn't lay back and say, oh, they'll get it. No. It says over 36 times, Le'ahavta et hager. You shall love the stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And today we read, Atem ditzavim hayom kulchem. You. You. We. I. We stand this day, all of us, with an Arab Rav, a mixed multitude of oppressed peoples who are described to have come forth out of Egypt. And I believe that it is time that we, American Jews, recognize that we cannot pretend that this isn't our problem. Imagine for a moment that a shift in history leads to the vast majority of American Jews coming from North Africa and the Middle East with dark skin and North African and Middle Eastern features. Do you honestly believe that we, the American Jewish community, would be as successful as we are today in America? We confess in public and in the plural. Ashamnu 
Bagadnu, Gazalnu, Tefalnu Shakel. We betray, we steal, we scorn, we act perversely, we are cruel, we scheme, we defy, we corrupt, we spoil, we lead others astray. In a free society, as Heschel taught us, some are guilty, that all are responsible. Later in our service, we will read, I reflect on the harm I have, have done to the world around me. Through my failure to take time to educate myself about complex social problems, through my failure to do my part as an active citizen and make my voice heard, through resigning myself to the way things are rather than working for change, through succumbing to racism and disdaining those different from myself. So how do we respond? What do we do? What is our version of a wieder Gutmachung, making things good again? The good news is we have a four-part process that is provided to us by our tradition. We must admit, we must seek to make restitution, we must seek forgiveness, and we must try to not repeat the same mistakes again. First is admission. We have to be willing to say aloud, this is a problem. When the vast majority of beggars in Houston streets are dark-skinned people of color, this is a problem. It is not the way things are supposed to be or the way things just turned out. It is a problem. The fact that I don't, I've never experienced walking into a store and feeling like I have someone else's eyes on me, worried about what I might do just because of the color of my skin, that's a problem. My light skin is a privilege because I am not barred or deterred or questioned or challenged about where I want to go in public just because of my skin. Restitution. What do we do? No, I'm not suggesting that you run out and the first African-American person you see apologize. No. That is not what I'm suggesting. The truth is, I don't know exactly what the plan is. But I know that today, we need to call it out as a problem. So what, we, what do we do first? We'll breathe. But there are some things we can do. First, we need to be able to remember the story. I don't mean remember like call the mind. I mean remember reconnect our story with this story. Remind ourselves that it is the same story. Only we have an accident of light skin. What role can we play? First of all, let's start with a simple one. Maybe it's not so simple. Officially, from here on out, the word Schwarza is no longer allowed. In any context, in any way, in any shape and form, it is essentially the Yiddish version of the N-word. So we need to stop. Secondly, we need to remind ourselves of our story, of our history. That German-speaking Jews came here in the 19th century during the time when slavery was still fully legal in the South. And these German-speaking brethren of probably many of us became very successful in the textile business. Where did those materials come from? They came from the South. They were made by slaves. 
in Eastern European Jews in the early part of the 20th century, those materials came from the Jim Crow South. The GI Bill that helped so many Jewish Americans afford college and a first home was systematically denied to African Americans. And I'm not saying that it is a white Jewish people's fault. This isn't about fault or blame. This is about recognizing the history. History also recounts in, I'm going to get the year right, in 1864, William Tecumseh Sherman of the Confederate Army was headed from Atlanta to his mar on his march to the sea. And because of the Union conquests of that area, there were many and many and many more freed slaves. Men, women, children, elderly, young, who had ended up following Sherman's army. Sherman was no friend to these former slaves. They were, unfortunately for him, a burden. But they kept following. And so they got to a bridge. I got to a, a, a creek called Ebenezer Creek, which was too wide and too deep to cross. So Sherman's army built a bridge. They dealt the bridge with the Confederacy following close by. They built a bridge and they told these former ex-slaves that first the army needed to get across and then they would come across. But as you probably have figured out, once the army got across, they dismantled the bridge. The estimates are somewhere between five and 10,000 former slaves who were left there between the water and the Confederate Army. A great number of them drowned. Many, many were shot and killed on the spot. And the rest were taken back into slavery. When the news got word to Washington about what had happened, this is what led to the special uh, permit number 15, which would allocate 400,000 acres of formerly white-owned land to these former slaves and others, also known as the 40 acres and a mule plan. But this law was overturned very quickly after President Lincoln's death, and it remains an unkept promise. But as I read it, all I could think about was the Israelites at the Red Sea with the Egyptians close behind them. And what would have happened to the Israelites had the waters not parted, we know they would have drowned, they would have been killed, they would have been taken back into slavery. Hayom nitzavim hayom kulchem. All of you, all of us, we stand here this day. And today, it's so many years late. But at least today, moving forward, we need to recognize that we Jews do not stand alone in these stories. And there's the stories of oppression and persecution and the need for restitution and reparations whatever they look like, however the policies are established to push them forward. 
But we cannot pretend that it's not our problem. Because if it's not our problem, then it's not our story. If it's not our story, then I'm not sure what Judaism is all about. May we find the wherewithal and the strength to fight against the forces in our society that would rather these things not be talked about, not be brought up. Let's fight against our desire for polite conversation and say it straight.